It's Monday, the 29th of August, 2011. And in this Boardroom Talk special podcast, Neil Pretorius, the Chief Executive of DRD Gold, with us in studio with results for the year to end June. Plans coming together really nicely, Neil. Your dividend, I suppose, which is the best reflection of health, the fourth year in a row that you've paid a dividend. This one's up 50%, still only 7.5 cents. So shareholders will be uh, hoping there's a lot more to come in future, but it's it's a sign of intent. Absolutely, Alec. And remember, we... We dipped into cash flows for uh, to uh, fund some capital reinvestment. We spent just over 320 million in the last 12 months on the upgrading of the ergo plant and the construction of the the Crown ergo pipeline and so forth. And and this is factory like uh, capital reinvestment. Once the money is spent, the money is spent, and then you know, over a period of time you can you can reap the benefits. Uh, having said that, though, it's still the second best. Uh, dividend in, in of South African gold mining companies on yield, on pure yield. So it's a low number, but it's a, it's a high percentage, it would seem. Mm. Well, it, as I say, it must be looking into the future, hope that that grows substantially. Absolutely. And, and one of the reasons why we've paid dividends four years in a row, notwithstanding the fact that we are still, some, uh, are still planning a bit of capital reinvestment into Ergo towards technology upgrades and so forth, we do want to establish a reputation as a dividend-paying company it's, uh, and move away from the gold option. Uh, profile that we had a few years back. It, it does seem to be a, a completely different opportunity then for people who are interested in the gold price going higher or believe the gold price will go higher but uh, don't want to be too exposed to the labor and other risks. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I think you know, with, with, a, with a cost uh, profile where, where, where it's currently trending, it's a fairly predictable uh, share, I suppose. You know, uh, Running a model on this, uh, almost an annuity type model, it's, it's not very difficult because you know what the, the resource is like. Uh, we, we update the market regularly on the kind of recoveries that we are getting out of this plant. So I think it's a simple and straightforward model to run. And, and, and that being the case, the, the only unexpected upside, I suppose, or downside would be cycles in the gold price because we don't hedge. We, at least we want to maintain or retain that, that bit of excitement in the, uh, in the business, I suppose. 250,000 Rand roughly per kilogram it costs you to get an ounce of gold. 300,000 Rand roughly you received in the past year. So that was the reason for the profit, the 50,000 Rand a kilogram. Yes. At the moment, though, the gold price is substantially higher than the price received. Does that suggest that that 50,000 could be 150,000 the year as a, for the year as a whole? In other words, you could treble your profits. The, the margins definitely uh, stand to improve from a higher gold price. And in fact, I think the the fact that uh, a small component of our costs um, are, 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 I suppose, distorted by the, the really high costs of the deep level underground circuit, uh, to an extent hides some of the, I suppose, the, the margin uh, opportunities on the, uh, the recycling circuit. So yes, I think there is definitely room for some robust margins going forward. You mentioned the underground side. That's uh, presumably still at play for us. What's yes. the state of play there? You have uh, evoked a law. You have brought in a rescue plan. Yes, Alec, I think it was important for us to, on the one hand, demonstrate to the market that this is very much a ring-fenced uh, risk exposure. It's not something that poses a, a, corporate, uh, a threat to the corporation as such. It's a limited company with its own legal personality. And I think once having established that, I think the market should provide us with an opportunity to now deal with the asset responsibly. We don't want to just uh, ditch it. I think there is an opportunity to deal with it responsibly. It might take a little bit longer than what we had initially thought it might be. But the, the market should take comfort from the fact that there is absolutely no risk to DRD Gold itself and the, and the actual cash earnings of DRD Gold coming from the, uh, uh, the profit-generating circuits. So there, there, there's, no, there's no further financial support, nor is there a legal obligation in terms of the Companies Act for additional financial support to its platform. You, you were talking with a Chinese company. Yes, we're looking at, uh, at a number of different options. Obviously, bringing a Chinese company in as a pure purchaser was one of the options, and I did an extensive uh, roadshow there. And we're still waiting for them to come and visit us. I believe that the visit is scheduled for later in September. Um, it, things do seem to take quite a, quite a long time to get organized over the, the logistics and so forth. The other opportunity or the other option that we're looking at is to simply just take a dilution in Blayfour against capital uh, investment. Spoke to the IDC about that, but they're not interested. But there might be some other players who are interested in taking a position there. Third opportunity or the third structure that we're looking at is simply just positioning it separately from DRD Gold as an investment, as a separate investment opportunity. Again, taking a, a dilution and, uh, and allowing for some of the 
you know, I suppose for, for not, not a revival, but an extension of that uh, gold option uh, scenario. So separately listing it? Uh, well, potentially. I don't think we would do a front-end listing, but maybe reversing it into, a, uh, into a, uh, an available uh, entity and uh, either doing some sort of an unbundling or maybe just a sell-off to uh, interested parties over time. What kind of gold price would Blayfuhr need to be sustainably viable? Gold price now is actually pretty good for Blayfuhr. We managed to avoid the winter tariffs, uh, relying on the, the remedies of, uh, of the business uh, rescue concept the Chapter 6 concept. So obviously that gave uh, the uh, cash flows a nice boost. And it, it's an ongoing, I suppose, saga whether or not those will become payable at all. Uh, you, you know that I've got very very firm views on the whole winter tariff scenario, but, but that gave them a bit of a boost. Um, what we need, uh, though, is a, a little bit of, of cooperation from the, the labor unions. There does seem to be a lack of understanding at this stage as to what this concept's all about. You know, I think there's a bit of suspicion amongst the unions. And as a consequence, unfortunately, the, uh, the rate of production at Blayford had dropped over the last two weeks. Um, we think it'll pick back up again over the next few days. You know, we've set up meetings with their national office and so forth. But if they can maintain the rate of production that they maintained up until June, for example, uh, volume production, uh, with uh, yield definitely having improved uh, over the last few weeks uh, for a variety of operational reasons. Blay Blayfour uh, washes its face. So in the long term, it could be an, an interesting gold option you know, for, those, uh, uh, for those rampant gold bulls, I suppose. Mm. What about exploration? Because in the, the bulk of the business, it is processing old mine dumps. Now, at some point in time, that material is going to run out. Yes, Alec, uh, you know, we're looking at technology improvements, obviously, uh, to make sure that we recover as much of the gold in those tailings as we possibly can. We have at our disposal the better part of 800 million tons of, of uh, material available for reclamation, uh, which will take a very long time, uh, more, than, more than two decades to, to reprocess. So I suppose the, the, the source of cash flow for this business is pretty secured depending obviously on gold price cycles and so forth and so forth. The, the optionality model, I think, um, you, you know, we, we, we tend to talk a lot about and reflect a lot about the potential downside of South Africa and sometimes forget that there are still some world-class uh, resources, uh, resources and deposits in South Africa itself. And, and we had a very long debate at our board meeting now uh, over the last week. And the scenario that we investigated was, what if there is no nationalization? What if ESCOM does, in fact, become a world-class provider of electricity in five years from now? And what if there is a, a technology solution for us? At ERPM, next to the old ERPM, in an entirely uh, new greenfields area, we're sitting on 18 million ounces of, uh, of gold with an in-situ grade uh, in the region of 9 grams a ton and not much deeper than between 700 and 1,200 meters below surface. Now, in the past, that would have been a fairly shallow mine uh, from uh, the perspective of, of South African uh, gold mining. They, I don't think one can at this stage summarily reject the idea or the concept that in five or eight years from now, with all these things that I spoke about earlier, uh, certainty on the policies going forward, certainty on services, certainty on electricity and so forth, that this may again become a very attractive resource. So we've decided that we will... Uh, uh, honor the undertaking that we'd given to the Department of Minerals and Energy when we applied, or the Department of Minerals, when we applied for these exploration, exploration licenses and explore the resource, uh, take it up the value curve and position that as an option which may have a, uh, a maturity date five years or eight years from now. So you're looking within South Africa primarily? Absolutely, yes. South Africa and Southern Africa. Once again, the, the political downside in, in Zimbabwe is in fact the stated position as we currently look at it. Zimbabwe uh, and the current government, in order to uh, uh, implement a policy that, that would appeal to its constituency, said 51% of minerals in Zimbabwe must belong to local Zimbabweans. That is the, the, the structure that we have in place. We've got a 50-50 structure in place, so there's a 1% dilution that needs to take place. So is the, if that is, from a political perspective, as bad as it's going to get in Zimbabwe, then from this point forward, it's really just upside for us. And I think we're ideally positioned there, having also recently extended our lease there by the better part of 20,000 hectares. And it's so shallow. It's so underexplored. You know, they were uh, uh, focusing mainly on farming uh, between 1938 and now. Uh, so so there are so, vast tracts in that country that just, has, that ha just haven't been touched. And, uh, and, and we want to take advantage of that. And it's interesting to note that in... Um, Mozambique, Pan-African Resources, is, seems to have a good deposit there in Manica. Is that an area also being 
bordering with both Zimbabwe and South Africa. Is it yes. a, a country that you've looked at? Yes, we're looking at the moment. We're looking at three potential deposits there, but very, very sort of desktop at this stage. We we have a, a local resource in Zimbabwe, a local uh, human resource in Zimbabwe, uh, looking at potential opportunities there, and and but also green fields. Uh, you know. The, trying to be the first in a particular area and see if we can take it up the value curve. Uh, if the gold price cycles remain more or less flat from now on, I would imagine, uh, we would be sitting, we're going to be sitting on fairly robust cash flows over the next five to six years. And I think we would want to make use of some of that to, to get involved in uh, potential greenfields opportunities in this sub-region. So the factory's working well. You've got Blayfors now that's been ring-fenced out of the way, and uh, your exploration opportunities are quite exciting. I think so, and we're trying to keep it uh, tight. Uh, you know, we try to keep it under a blanket. We, I don't, I'm not too keen to have my colleagues fly into, you know, areas where they've got to get uh, all sorts of funny vaccinations and that sort of thing. It's right here on our doorstep, and, and whilst it might not look particularly attractive from a political perspective. The fact that on both, in both those countries where we're looking, there are firm statements of, uh, of, uh, of policy. Uh, in fact, to an extent, slightly firmer than what we've got here at the moment in South Africa. We think we should be looking there and, uh, and collecting resources. And if South Africa were to get more certainty, that would open a door for you here too? I think so, yes. I think South Africa will get more certainty, Alec. You know, you, uh, I suppose unattractive policy is not always a bad thing. All, all you need really is uh, firmness on policy, policy certainty, because you could build your model, uh, model, model build your, uh, your, your model, construct your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, capital reinvestment program or investment program around policy certainty. You, you could bring those factors in. Uh, what, what makes it unattractive for investors is that uh, there's a lack of, of certainty uh, with regard to certain policy issues at this stage. Neil Pretorius is the chief executive of DRD Gold.